Thanks so much, Ron, and I uh, really appreciate Chuck originally inviting me to come and Tom continuing the invitation and to be here in conjunction with this great voice for truth, the Word 101.5 FM, that's really making a difference for the kingdom of God. Thank you for being here today. America's collapse is inevitable. And the reason has absolutely nothing to do with ISIS. I first came to understand why America's collapse is inevitable a few years ago. Ron mentioned our building program at First Baptist Church Dallas. Uh, in order to create this new campus on seven blocks of downtown Dallas, we first of all had to destroy the uh, present campus. It was about a million square feet of space in six different buildings, and so the question was, how do you bring all of this down and start over again? So we met with the demolition people, and they said the best way to bring down these buildings without bringing down the surrounding skyscrapers is through an implosion. And they explained to me what they were going to do. They said, we're going to take 200 pounds of dynamite and attach this dynamite to key structures within these six buildings, the dynamite will explode, there'll be a pause, and then the law of physics will take over, and the buildings will collapse upon themselves. So I said, that sounds pretty good to me, let's go for it. So on a Saturday morning in October, a few years ago, they closed downtown Dallas, and we had the time of our implosion. And so uh, we were standing, the mayor and I, and all of the news media were standing on a close-by building overlooking the structure, all of the media was there, CNN, Fox and Friends was carrying it live, and I tell you, it was really pretty exciting. I stood there with the mayor in front of this big red button. They did the countdown, five, four, three, two, one. I pressed the button, and just as they promised, the dynamite began to explode, and after the exploding dynamite, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing nothing happened. Pastors, you can identify with this. My first thought was, who am I going to fire first for this? I mean, I have never been so embarrassed in my life. I mean, we were told later 17 million people around the world were watching this. And I could just see this being replayed endlessly on YouTube. Pastors implosion, a dud. But for what seemed like an eternity, it was only actually a few seconds. Because soon the ground began to vibrate. Those buildings began to shake. And the sound was like standing next to a jet engine. And within 30 seconds, those once mighty buildings collapsed to nothing but a plume of debris-filled dust. I learned something that morning about implosions. They are sudden. They are dramatic. They begin with a series of seemingly unrelated explosions followed by a delay and then a sudden collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last 50 years, there have been three explosive decisions by our Supreme Court that have so weakened the moral and spiritual infrastructure of our country that our collapse is inevitable. The explosion has already occurred. The implosion is coming. We are just living in that delay right now. What are these three explosive decisions? They are decisions that have affected the course of our nation more than any mandate from Congress, more than any executive order from the Oval Office. That first explosive decision occurred in 1962, almost 50, more than 50 years ago. It was a Supreme Court case of Engel versus Vitale. This is the case that removed prayer from the public schools. And of course, this was just the beginning decision of a long list of decisions that showed governments not neutrality, but hostility, not toward religion, but toward Christianity in particular. This was followed in 1963 by the removal of Bible reading, and on and on and on it went until 1980. The climactic decision was Stone versus Graham, which outlawed the posting of the Ten Commandments in public schools. 
And what was the reasoning of the Supreme Court for why it was suddenly unconstitutional to post the Ten Commandments? If I were just to summarize the court's ruling, you would think I was making it up. You would think I was speaking pastorally, if you know what I'm talking about. So let me read to you the decision verbatim of why the Supreme Court said you can no longer post the Ten Commandments. The court said, quote, if the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments. This is not a permissible state objective under the First Amendment. Can you believe that? If the Ten Commandments are posted, children might actually read them, and if they read them, they might actually venerate and obey them, and God forbid they might actually follow those commandments. That is unconstitutional. God help us. How did we come to that point as a nation? Do you realize 118 years earlier, the Supreme Court had said, in the case of Vidal versus Gerard's executors, why may not the Bible and especially the New Testament without note or comment be read and taught as divine revelation in the school. Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. Where can the purest principles of morality be lear learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? That was the Supreme Court 118 years earlier, and now the Supreme Court says you can't even post the Ten Commandments. I don't think it is a coincidence that 17 years after the Supreme Court did this in 1980, in the year 1997, in the hallway of another Kentucky school, the Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky, a group of students gathered together to pray as they did every morning before school. And as these five students prayed in front of the lockers, they had their head bowed. They were praying. A 14-year-old who had obtained a handgun opened fire on those five students, killing two and seriously wounding three. It all occurred in a Kentucky school where 17 years earlier the Supreme Court said, you cannot post the words, thou shalt not kill. Now how did we get into this shape as a nation? I'll tell you exactly how. We have allowed the atheists, the secularists, the infidels to hijack our Constitution and take control of this country. That's exactly how this has happened. I mean, it's been very clear of what our forefathers intended. Look, it's very clear in the First Amendment. The Bible says Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We know what happened. The Congress said when our forefathers came here, we don't want a state church in which people are coerced to come and worship against their will. They had had their fill of that in England. They said, we're not going to allow this government to establish a state church. But what happened? Sandra Day O'Connor, others, twisted the words of the First Amendment. They changed the word establish to endorse. And they said, now the test is endorsement. Is government in any way endorsing a particular religion? And if so, that's unconstitutional. Ladies and gentlemen, for 150 years, our Supreme Court said over and over and over again, America is a Christian nation. America is a Christian nation. And while it's true, we recognize everybody's religion, or right to worship any God or no God at all, we've also shown a distinctive preference for the Christian faith as a country. That has been our heritage. But now we have twisted the words of the First Amendment to say you can't give any acknowledgement to God in the public square. But even if the Supreme Court had ruled correctly on the meaning of the First Amendment for the last 50 years, even if they were correct, which they're not, do you think that changes God's attitude at all? Do you think God looks down on America and says, oh, well, now you're an exception. 
You have an establishment clause of the First Amendment. You don't have to play by the rules I've established for everybody else. Ladies and gentlemen, the First Amendment does not trump the First Commandment. The First Commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Listen to me. America is not a respecter of people or nations. A few months ago, I was standing in the U.S. Capitol in Statuary Hall. I was there for an event called Washington Man of Prayer, and Mike Huckabee and Ted Cruz and others were with us and uh, talking to the group. And uh, before I spoke, the Marine Band played the Star Spangled Banner. And ringing in that hall, it was a very majestic experience. And after they finished, I stood up. And uh, I didn't mean to insult them, didn't have that intention at all. But after they finished, I said, as moving as that experience is, you need to remember, God does not get goosebumps when he hears the Star Spangled Banner. God doesn't salute when he sees the American flag passing by. God is no respecter of people or nations. Any nation that reverences God will be blessed by God, and any nation, including the United States, that rejects God will be rejected by God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now that was the first explosion. The second explosion occurred in 1973, and it came from our own city of Dallas, Texas. It was the case of Roe v. Wade, which legalized the murder of children in the womb. And since the time of Roe v. Wade, 50 million children have been murdered through abortion. Every year, 1.3 million children continue to be murdered in the womb. Now, I know what the conventional wisdom is right now in politics. The conventional wisdom is, look, you conservatives need to be quiet about these social issues, these moral issues. If we're going to get a conservative elected, we've just got to leave all that stuff alone and talk about economics. All people care about is economic policy. They don't care anything about social policy. Well, let's just say that's true. Let's look at abortion from the physical side, the fiscal side, the economic side. Did you know one study suggests that if those 50 million people who have been murdered since 1973, if they had been allowed to live and become productive citizens, they would have contributed anywhere from 35 to 70 trillion dollars to the gross national product over the last 50 years. If those children were alive today, there would be no social security crisis. There'd be no Medicare crisis. You can't murder 20% of your population without great economic ramifications in your country. But those economic ramifications, they pale in comparison to the spiritual ramifications of abortion. All you have to do is look and see in history how God has treated nations that kill their children to know what God's going to do to America. I mean, think about Israel. I mean, Israel was the one nation in the world that could actually say we are God's chosen nation. The Israelites were chosen by God. But because they sacrificed their children to the pagan god Moloch there in the Valley of Hinnom, God raised up the ungodly Assyrians and the ungodly Babylonians to come and bring judgment upon his own people. You know, I hear people say all the time, I just don't understand why God would allow these Islamic terrorists to bring destruction to our nation uh, like, like, like happened on 9-11. How did that happen? Ladies and gentlemen, God will use anything to bring judgment to any nation that rejects his commandments. Just look at what happened with Israel. God used an ungodly people to bring judgment upon his own people. In more recent days, We've seen the Allied forces in World War II. They were raised up to crush Nazi Germany because Nazi Germany took children to the crematorium by the train loads. As we look at history and God's love for children, do we really have to wonder what's going to happen to a nation that celebrates the killing of children in the womb? The third explosive decision is a decision, again, that actually began in Texas. It was called Lawrence versus Garner in 2003. 
And in this Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court st struck down our state's anti-sodomy acts. Now, some people, even conservatives, get a little nervous about this, and they say, well, well, do we really want government in our bedrooms telling us what we can and what we can't do? But here's the point. What made that ruling significant was the basis for that ruling. The basis for that ruling was a person's sexual inclinations or preferences represent who they are, and government has no right to in any way restrict that. Now, this is 2003. Justice Scalia, who was one of the dissenters, was able to see where this was leading. Uh, thir Eleven years ago, he wrote, This ruling today leaves on pretty shaky ground state laws limiting marriage to opposite-sex couples. And, of course, what he prophesied has come to pass. State after state is seeing their marriage restrictions being struck down. The fact is, for the first 226 years of our nation's history, our nation represented that marriage was a unique relationship between a man and a woman. In 1885, in the case of Murphy versus Ramsey, the Supreme Court said, what legislation could be more wholesome than that which sees the family as consisting in and springing from the union of one man and one woman in the holy estate of matrimony? There, the Supreme Court defined marriage, one man and one woman. And for 226 years, our nation has seen that. But of course, that has been eroding over the last few years. And it was just about a year and a half ago that finally the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, which was, by the way, signed into law by Bill Clinton. The Defense of Marriage Act. I remember that night very well because O'Reilly had me on that night to debate a homosexual activist. And we were there debating this decision back and forth. And I pointed out the sociological studies that showed how children do better when they have both biological parents and so forth and so forth. And so this spokesman, this gay spokesman, who himself had adopted a child with his gay partner, he said, Pastor, I'm offended by what you are saying. Because you're saying, you're suggesting that a heterosexual relationship is superior to a homosexual relationship, and I take offense at that. And I said, sir, with all due respect to you, you wouldn't be here tonight arguing with me. You wouldn't be alive if it were not for a heterosexual relationship that produced you at one point. I mean, nature shows us that that is God's plan. You know, Sarah McClanahan is a socio sociologist from Princeton University, hardly a bastion of conservatism, you know, Princeton sociologist. And yet she said, if we were trying to design the best environment in which to rear a child, it would be an environment where the child was connected to both of his biological parents. Gee, that kind of sounds like a family to me, doesn't it? That's God's plan. Now look, we realize that's not possible all of the time because of death or divorce or some other tragedy, but that is the relationship that we ought to encourage as a country. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what if you know, gays want to get out of marriage and marry? That's no skin off your back. Why do you get all hot and bothered about that? Look, we know the end result, how this all turns out. Fact is, in Scandinavian countries that have legalized same-sex marriage over a long period of time, you know what they discovered? It's not that that many gays actually went out and got married. What they saw was the heterosexual marriage rate dropped precipitously. Because the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you counterfeit something, you cheapen the value of the real thing. I mean, if marriage is whatever you want it to be, two uh, men, two women, three men and a woman, I mean, if it's whatever you want it to be, why bother to get married anyway? Did you see the study last week? The marriage rate in America has dropped to the lowest level in 93 years. And it's creating all kind of social instability of children being reared in single-family homes because we're destroying the basic unit that God created in which to rear children, the family. Now, my point is simply this. No nation that outlaws the mention of God in the public square, that sanctions the killing of millions of children, that destroys the most basic unit of society, the family, no nation can survive that. 
And that's why I say the explosions have already occurred. The collapse is coming right now. The point is, what are we to be doing in the meantime? I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, this is the most depressing message I've ever heard. Let's just pass the revolver around and end it right now. No. This is a message of encouragement. Because the fact is, God has given us a very specific assignment as to what we're to be doing. And pastors here today, that assignment begins with us. I believe the preservation of America for the proclamation of the gospel depends upon pastors fulfilling their calling. And for pastors to fulfill their calling, they have to understand what that calling is. And that calling is to be a teacher, but it's also to be a prophet and an evangelist. What are we to be doing? What are we to be doing in this decadent culture? Well, Jesus gave us the marching orders in Matthew 5, 13 and 14. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 13, remember what he said? He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now you remember, pastors, you can look this up on Logos if you want to, what salt was. In Jesus' day, salt was not just something to raise your blood pressure, okay? It had a much more important function. Salt was a preservative. Now, the role of salt was not to prevent the decay of meat. It was to delay the decay of the meat. It couldn't prevent it, but it could delay it. The salt gave the meat a little longer shelf life. Eventually, the meat had to be thrown out as rotten, but it gave the meat longer time on the shelf. And that's what Jesus is saying. In this culture, you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are salt, we are preservatives, we are to delay the decay of our culture. You said, no, wait a minute, Pastor. Delay the decay of our culture? Don't you believe in the sovereignty of God? Don't you believe God has written on his calendar in indelible ink the day of America's collapse and that there's not one thing you're going to do to lengthen that or shorten that, that it's all part of God's sovereign plan? Don't you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Until I read my Bible. Because when I read my Bible, I go back to the Old Testament story of Jonah. Remember Jonah? God said to Jonah, I'm going to destroy the wicked city of Nineveh. But then in Jonah 3.10 it says, God changed his mind. God relented of his decision. Now I'm going to be honest with you, I don't understand that. If you have a question about that, see Ron Walters after the meeting today. He can explain that to you. I don't understand that. But what I do understand is because of the righteous actions of Jonah, he delayed the destruction of Nineveh, giving the Ninevites more opportunity to respond. Now, what's interesting when you look at history is God did eventually destroy Nineveh just as he said he was. But he delayed the collapse in order that more might repent. Now, Jesus said it's the same for us. There is a reason we're to stand up as Christians and push back against this tide of immorality and ungodliness in our culture. We want to give our culture a longer time to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, you know what has happened? We as Christians, and it starts with those of us who are pastors, we've engaged in what I call silo spirituality. We tell people, well, our Christians, well, our Christian faith, that's for us. But for us to take our values and our beliefs and impose them on unbelievers and on the culture, well, that's unchristian, that's un-American, and it may be illegal. Where did we come up with that kind of theology? Let me tell you something today. Jesus Christ is not just Lord over the church. He's Lord over all creation. Jesus is not just interested in spiritual people and spiritual things. He's interested in everything, including government. And when you look into the Bible, you look at those men who were called to be prophets of God, whether it was Daniel or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or in the New Testament, John the Baptist. They didn't just speak to God's own people. They were willing to stand up and confront an ungodly culture and ungodly leaders and say without stuttering or stammering, thus saith 
the Lord. And we're to do that today as well. If we're going to be in a preservative, we've got to get out of our holy huddles and actually make a difference in the culture in which we're going to live right now. That is what God has called us to do. Well, how do we do that? How do we influence our culture? How do we push back? How do we try to give America and our world longer to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Hold on to your seats. I'm going to tell you how. One word, and it's a dirty, filthy word to most Christians and most pastors. The word is politics. <gasps> politics. Oh, no, no. We can't get involved in politics. We're citizens of the next world, not of this world. And boy, pastors, they sure shouldn't be preaching politics from the pulpit. You know what the word politics means? The Latin word means to influence. Whenever you say Christians should not get involved in politics, what you're really saying is Christians should not try to influence the culture in which they live. Now, can anybody say that with a straight face? Now, some of you are looking at me funny, so stay with me on this. In the Old Testament, it was the king who determined the spiritual direction of the nation. If it was a righteous king, God blessed the nation. If it was an unrighteous king, God cursed the nation. Everybody with me on that? Nobody got to elect the king. The king was the king. But John Jay, the first chief justice of our United States Supreme Court, said, God has given us the privilege of selecting our rulers. And it is our duty and our privilege to select Christians as our leaders. When I gave that quote to Chris Matthews, he almost had a heart, heart attack right on the set of hardball right there. Oh, I can't believe he said it. Yeah, he said it. He said it. You see, we are the ones in this culture who choose our leaders. Every time you go into the voting booth, you are casting a vote for righteousness or for unrighteousness. We are the ones who determine the spiritual direction of our nation. And I believe God has called upon us to elect leaders, not who exhibit Democrat values or Republican values, but who will stand for biblical values. God will bless a nation that does that. Listen, Fox News just sent me something last night to look over. It is a brand new Pew Research poll, and it is a shock poll. Pew Research discovered that 75% of Americans believe that religion's influence in America is waning. That's not a shock. But what is a shock is a large number of people since 2010, since the last midterm elections, a large number of people now believe that more politics should be preached from the pulpit, that pastors ought to speak out more on social issues than they have been. Why is that? We have seen what happens when pastors are muzzled. We're reaping the consequences as a culture of what happens when Christians stand or fail to stand up and push back against evil. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that in the last election, 2012, only 50% of evangelical Christians were registered to vote? And of that half that were registered to vote, only half of those actually showed up at the polls to cast a vote. Millions sat down. Millions said, I'm not going to get involved. What I'm saying to you today is, if Christians would stand up and vote, not for Republican or Democrat values, but for biblical values, we could turn this country around overnight. And I believe God has called us to do that. We are to be salt in this world. We are to do everything we can to delay the decay of the coming destruction. Why are we to do that? Not so that we can save America. God has not called any of us to save America. That is not our mission. We've not been called to save America, but we have been called to save Americans from the coming judgment of God by introducing them to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the second part of this mandate. Jesus said, yes, you're to be salt, but he also said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that our job ultimately is to share the message of Christ 
with as many people as possible. We're never to forget that is our calling. And pastors here today, your church will never be any more interested in preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel than you are. The church will never be any more evangelistic than you are. No church ever rises above the level of its leader. If you want your church to be here, you have to be up here. And your commitment to winning the lost to Christ. You know, I got convicted about this personally a few years ago. I'll be honest with you. I started looking around and saying, well, you know, God's blessed us with this great facility, all these staff members, all of this budget money, but what are we doing where we are right now to make a difference for Jesus Christ? I mean, what's our plan for winning our city to Christ? And so, I'm not going to say it was divine revelation, but I got an idea. And I introduced it to our church, and I said, you know, over the next six weeks, I want to invite you to partner with the pastor. We call it the little program Partnering with the Pastor. And I said, I want you over the next six weeks to identify one or two people right here in Dallas, you know, who need to know Christ as Savior. I want you to begin praying for them, talking to them. But what I really want you to do is six weeks from now, on this particular Sunday, I want you to invite them to come to church. And here's the deal I'll make with you. If you will invite somebody and have them with you on that day, with God's help, I'll do the very best job I can do preaching the gospel. And so we had about a thousand of our members who signed up to be partners with the pastor that day. And so on that particular Sunday, they brought their guest. And that day we had well over a thousand guests. And when I gave the invitation, 348 responded to accept Christ as their savior. Now, you say, oh, that wouldn't work where I am. Maybe, maybe not. But what's your plan? You know, I think about D.L. Moody, the great evangelist. Somebody said to him after a crusade, I don't like the way you do evangelism. And Moody said, well, I don't like the way you don't do evangelism. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the key is, what is your plan? You may have a much better strategy than that, but we all need a strategy to do the one thing we were left here to do. Have you ever thought about this? Why is it that God left you here on earth instead of taking you to heaven the moment he saved you? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we all know God created us and saved us to have fellowship with him. We all agree on that. But couldn't God have much better fellowship if we were up there with him in heaven? Instead of leaving us here on earth where we get distracted so easily and fall into sin and all other kind of things. I mean, think about it. God has delayed his gratification for a while. He's delayed the fulfillment of fellowship with us. He's left us here on earth for one reason. And the reason he left us here is not to build a big church or a successful career. He didn't leave us here to accumulate a lot of money that we're going to have to leave behind or leave to ungrateful children and grandchildren. He didn't even leave us here to have a happy family life. God left us here for one purpose, and that's to fulfill his agenda, his mission of sharing the gospel with as many people as possible. You know, the Apostle Paul understood that. He understood that after his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, his life was never the same. He was intoxicated from that point on with one purpose, and that was to share the gospel with as many people as possible. And it's through that filter, that purpose, that he viewed everything that happened to him in life, even tragedies. Remember in Philippians 1, Paul was in prison, and uh, he was saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. You know, my old friend Howard Hendricks used to say, when Paul wrote those words, he wasn't on the French Riviera sipping a pina colada. He was in prison facing what could have been his execution. But you know what he said? Man, I'm rejoicing. You know why he was rejoicing? He says in chapter 1, because my circumstances have turned out for the progress, the expansion of the gospel. As people are looking at me, they're getting courage to share the gospel. This is great! Now you know, if Paul had had the same purpose statement for living that most of us have, peace, prosperity, pleasure, the avoidance of pain. That's what most people in your pews are living for. 
That's what most of us are living for. If that had been his goal in life, why, his imprisonment was a tremendous tragedy. It was a detour from the fulfillment of his life purpose. But Paul had a bigger purpose, the sharing of Jesus Christ. And from that perspective, he said, this is tremendous. And then in chapter 2, he turned to the Philippians, and he said in verses 15 and 16, and as for you, you are to be in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation, children of light, holding forth the word of life. Think about when Paul wrote these words. Boy, the administration then was much worse than the administration today. Nero was on the throne in Rome. Talk about persecuting Christians, an ungodly culture. But Paul said, don't get discouraged over that. Rejoice, because there has never been a better time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ than right now. You see, Paul understood a principle, and that is, the darker the background, the brighter the light. The darker the background, the brighter the light. I had to learn that truth the hard way a few years ago. My uh, youngest daughter, Dorothy, uh, was celebrating uh, a great event in her life, and I wanted to help her celebrate it. And I guess I'm far enough removed now from the event to tell you what it was. She had broken up with this no-good, worthless boyfriend she had been dating, <laughs> and I was so excited about it. I mean, God does answer prayers. And so I said, Dorothy, I mean, this is a great decision. I'm going to take you to the mall, and I'm going to buy you whatever you want. Now, I want you to know what I had in mind when I said, whatever you want. I was thinking about going to Forever 21, you know, and getting one of those $20 or $30 dresses. That's what I had in mind. That's not what Dorothy had in mind. We got to the mall, and she led me right past Forever 21 into a jewelry store, a very expensive jewelry store in Dallas. So we walked up to the counter, and... After a few moments, the uh, salesman came, and he came, stood in front of us, looked at my daughter, and said, good to see you again. <laughs> at that point, I knew I'd been had. <laughs> he said, would you like to look at that ring you were looking at yesterday? <laughs> she said, yes. So he went back, came back with this little box, opened up the box, but then he took a piece of black, Felt, and he laid it on top of the plexiglass counter. And then once he had that black felt on the counter, he took that ring and plopped it right in the center of that piece of felt. The contrast between that black background and that ring was so great, it almost blinded me to the price of the ring. Not quite, but it almost did. <laughs> you see, he was a good salesman. He understood the principle, the darker the background, the brighter the light. Yes, our culture is dark, and it's getting darker. But ladies and gentlemen, there has never been a better time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ than right now. Because as this world becomes more hopeless, the hope of the gospel shines that much more brightly. These are great times to be a Christian. And that's what we ought to be mobilizing our people to do and understand. You say, well, a pastor, wait a minute. This is the most schizophrenic message I've ever heard in my whole life. I mean, tell me, what, what are we supposed to be doing? Are we supposed to be involved in pushing back against evil and politics? Or are we supposed to be involved in evangelism and discipleship? Which is it? Well, what did Jesus say? Did he say, you're to be salt or you're to be light? No, he said, you're to be salt and you're to be light. We are to do both. Not either or, both. We are to be balanced in our ministry and in our life. Christians have got to learn how to multitask. Not just do one thing, to do both things. But folks, please don't confuse the word balance with passive. This is no time for God's people to be passive. I think about the words of William Watkins in his book, The New Absolutes. He said, it is time for Christians to reject the new tolerance and become a people marked by intolerance. Not an intolerance that unleashes hate upon people, 
but an intolerance that is unwilling to allow error to masquerade as truth any longer. An intolerance that is willing to stand up and call good, good, and evil, evil. May God grant us the courage to do that. Thank you very much.